Greetings and salutations, fellow book readers. This is Mark, and the book I will review today is The Stories of Paul Bowles, which seems appropriate since I am in Tangier, where Bowles spent the last 50 years of his life. Uh, before we continue, this is personalized, limited edition of the stories of Paul Bowles with a leather cover designed and made by me. At the end of the video, I will tell you a couple of ways of how you can get one for yourself, if you are interested. Now let's get back to the review. The Stories of Paul Bowles is a collection of short stories by the American writer Paul Bowles. I think Bowles is somewhat underappreciated as a writer, in spite of, or maybe because of being very eclectic professionally. He wrote novels, short fiction, uh, poetry, and travel articles, and also translated and composed music. I think he had a great potential as a novelist if he could focus on it more. He only wrote a few in a period of less than 20 years, and after his wife became more sick and died, since he gave up on novels, perhaps couldn't find energy to focus for an extended period of time. So he dedicated his time to poetry and short fiction, and also music. Bowles was an expert most of his life, living outside the US and the Western world. He went to Tangier because somebody he respected suggested it, but he said he might have as well gone somewhere else. He felt like a stranger everywhere, including Tangier, where he spent most of his life. He said life is not about other people, but about oneself against everybody. So perhaps this self-chosen isolation had effect on his professional recognition. But he didn't seem to care for it and maybe enjoyed privacy as a compensation. He did have a few visitors, not only writers, The Beats, Kerouac, Boros, and others, but also the Rolling Stones, who were interested in Moroccan music. There was a lot of speculation about Ball's sexuality, caused by his somewhat eccentric marriage, and he was rather ambiguous about the whole situation. He didn't seem to care for it much. Early in his life, he was exposed to a lot of naked bodies, probably through art, and it seems to have traumatized him. After it, he said he didn't care to see one for the rest of his life. He found human body hideous, even repulsive. Women had too much flesh and men too much hair. I remember reading one of Somerset Mons novels, who also seemed somewhat sexually distant, and in it he writes that no animal ages as horribly as the human. Maybe if you don't find the human body attractive, then sex will seem as an unpleasant chore. I like to watch old interviews with Bowles. He comes across as a private person, living his life, relaxed, enjoying his daily pipe of hashish, and not trying to shock nor impress anybody. What is the stories of Paul Bowles about? It is a collection of short stories inspired by the author's life, extensive travels, stories he heard, and the experiences of living in Tangier. A bit of the plot. The plot is a collection of fictional stories. I will mention a few of them. The Echo is about a young girl on a break from college in the US coming to visit her mother in Colombia. The mother is living with her implied lesbian lover, and there is an obvious antagonistic friction between the lover and the girl, especially coming from and instigated by the butch lover, and the conflict has an explosive end. To me, the story is about coming of age, losing one's parents, mother, not literally, but more in a psychological and emotional sense, at the time we realize we are on our own. Of course, some people keep their mommy forever. Also, the story might have something to do with Bowles and his wife, who was bisexual and had preference for her own sex. Perhaps Bowles had to deal with competition, which occasionally was not pleasant. A distant episode is about a man, professor of linguistics, revisiting after 10 years an isolated desert village and finding the hard way that everything changes, the place and more importantly the people, the relation one used to have with them. 
The man looked at him dispassionately in the gray morning light. With one hand, he pinched together the professor's nostrils. When the professor opened his mouth to breathe, the man swiftly seized his tongue and pulled on it with all his might. The professor was gagging and catching his breath. He did not see what was happening. He could not distinguish the pain of the brutal yanking from that of the sharp knife. Then there was an endless choking and spitting that went on automatically, as though he were scarcely a part of it. Call it Corazon, an exotic trip on a boat, husband's idea. The wife is not very excited about it, but has to put up with it because she is dependent on the husband. And this creates a constant conflict between the two. The moral from one side seems to be that sometimes the price to pay is too high and nothing, even death, is worse. And from the other side, the fear of loss usually is much greater than the loss itself. It might be even positive and desired, but to know it, one needs to go through it. Frightfulness is never more than an unfamiliar pattern. The scorpion is about getting old, feeling death approaching, and saying goodbye to the place and life. Under the sky, a man, Arab, having his way with a woman in cemetery, forcefully, it is a reflection on local customs, male dominance, but also dealing with loss, the only way we know how to deal with it, which is the result of our upbringing. El Paso Rojo, two sisters left alone after the mother dies, still virgin but too old to marry, and have to learn to deal with their new reality. And each one does it in her own way, one accepting that it is too late, and the other trying to recuperate, and the other trying to recuperate some of the lost time, but also realizing it is too late and taking what is still available. You can't, Charia, cried her sister, wide-eyed. You have never done it before. Why do you do it now? Charia had laughed moderately. Just a whim, she had said. Pages from Cold Point, both touching on subject of being gay, possibly himself, which probably was not easy back in the earlier part of the 20th century. Interestingly, it is not told from the point of being gay, but rather having to deal with gayness in others. The narrator is a man living on a tropical island between conservative locals. His teenage son is staying for an indefinite time. The son engages in some questionable sexual activities, and the father is warned about the possible consequences. So he's faced with a dilemma, choosing between his son to have a closer relationship or the comfortable existence he became accustomed to on the island. Perhaps the story is related to Bolt's own speculated gay tendencies, which he preferred to keep private, and his family, his father, having to deal with it. Pester Dao at Takate is about the clash of civilizations, or rather cultures. The story takes place in an isolated Native American village, where a pastor, trying to Christianize savages, becomes aware of how little power his God has over the people who don't care for him. Also, it is about loneliness, being between people you don't have much in common with, having almost constant human presence, but feeling alone, even scared, because you realize the limitations of the God you made yourself dependent on. Tea on the Mountain is about a woman twisting for some exotic adventure with younger men, something that would be thrown on back home, but she is far away between people who don't know her and won't judge her. And even if they do, it will not have any repercussions for her. How many midnights, a couple in the 1940s, New York, planning life together and already dealing with the psychological consequences of their decision before any material, tangible problems arise, uh, the self created unnecessary stress caused by fear of what might happen. The Delicate Prey is one of the better known stories, the title story in one of the other Bolsk's collections. The plot takes place somewhere in the Sahara, locals navigating through the sand on camels. A trio of men runs into a solitary traveler. There is the initial suspicion and 
attention, which is well founded, because the encounter turns into a show of very intense and graphic violence. The man moved and surveyed a young body lying on the stones. He ran his finger along the razor blade. A pleasant excitement took possession of him. He stepped over, looked down, and saw the sex that sprouted from the base of the belly. Not entirely conscious of what he was doing, he took it in one hand and brought his other arm down with the motion of a reaper wielding a sickle. It was swiftly severed, a round dark hole was left, flushed with the skin. He stared a moment blankly. The story seems to be about the violent nature of the locals, probably created by the hostility of the environment they inhabit, the competition for scarce resources, and extensive use of drugs, hashish, likely the only escape from the harsh reality, since consumption of alcohol is prohibited in Islam. Of course, there is also the famous hospitality of the desert dwellers, but probably it is a part of the balancing act. So you can say I am not a bad guy, I gave him a cup of tea before I killed him. I am simplifying the complexities of human behavior, and I am sure some will not agree. But based on my experience and observations, there is this reflexive, violent tendency in the people who inhabit North Africa and the Middle East. Even the body language and the speech is often very aggressive. Like I mentioned, it might have something to do with physical environment and hardship, and hardship of everyday life. Maybe the desert brings out the very best and the very worst in people that inhabit it. The constant shift between extremes in environment and its inhabitants. I think the story underlines the violent nature of living in the desert and the violent history of the region. Then, ashamed of his nervousness, feeling that Dries was watching and mocking him, although the youth's eyes were unseeing with pain, he kicked him over onto his stomach where he lay making small spasmatic movements. And as the Mongari followed this with his eyes, a new idea came to him. It would be pleasant to inflict an ultimate indignity upon the young Filali. He threw himself down, this time he was vociferous and leisurely in his enjoyment. Eventually he slept. At dawn he awoke and reached for his razor, lying on the ground nearby. Dris moaned faintly. The Mongari turned him over and pushed the blade back and forth with a sewing motion into his neck until he was certain he had severed the windpipe. Then he rose, walked away, and finished the loading of the camels he had st started the day before. Perhaps in the Sahara, you only trust what you can see, as far as you can see. And even this sometimes is nothing more than a mirage. Dona Faustina is a horror story, something Poe might have written. It seems to be inspired by the pre-Columbian Indian myths and traditions, uh, human sacrifices, and the power one can get from consuming their body parts. It shows how some pagan traditions in the Americas have adapted and mixed with Christianity. The frozen field is about childhood, seen from the perspective of a young child. Maybe the author remembering his own childhood. The memories, always either happy or brutal, never neutral. Perhaps some of the experiences necessary to create an adjusted and functional adult, but they can also create lifelong damage. Often the only difference is the interpretation. The children seem to be a lot more perceptive than we give them credit for, and this makes them a lot more susceptible to what happens around them. The child in the story is the only child present at a large family gathering, Christmas. A lot of attention is given to him, but because he is the only child, he feels lonely and disconnected, even blames himself for the conflicts arising between the adults, and he longs for an imaginary wolf to come to his rescue. The wolf was out there in the night, running along paths that no one had ever seen, down the hill and across the meadow, stopping to drink at the deep place in the brook where the ice had not formed.
the stiff hairs of his coat had caught the snow. He shook himself and climbed up the bank to where Donald sat waiting for him. Then he lay down beside him, putting his heavy head in Donald's lap. Donald leaned over and buried his face in the shaggy fur of his scarf. After a while, they both got up and began to run together, faster and faster, across the fields. The boy even fantasizes about the wolf killing his unpleasant and abusive father. It might relate to Bolz's own feelings about his father, and also feeling all his life as an outsider. <laughs>